Good morning, church. It, it is really incredible how God takes regular human beings like us, fills us with his presence to change a world that's hurting and broken. This church started you know, 19 years ago, and this is all God needed to do was get a vision to a person. And we could get so distracted by life's and life's problems that we never fulfill destiny and our purpose. Your problems that you're facing today are not meant to distract you, but they're meant to prepare you, right? And if you understand that, I'm just going through this for preparation. Now, your life should not be a trial. And that is, if you're constantly in a trial your whole life, there's something wrong. But as a believer, the reality is, you'll go through some difficulties, trials, challenges, but the Bible says this, that when you're going through it, count it joy. Knowing that the testing of your faith or your belief um, is going to produce an endurance in your character, that you're going to be able not only to get a victory, you're going to be able to hold a victory. And, you know, and I was just ta I was talking to someone backstage today, and we're talking about giftings, and you could be talented. And your gifts can take you great places, but it's your character that keeps you there. So be careful that you're not highly gifted with weak, weak, weak character and little integrity. Because you will, not, you will not last. God doesn't want you to have victory. He wants you to live in victory. God doesn't want you to just experience joy. He wants you to have it. How many believe that? Come on. We don't want to just start a church. We want to be a church and continue being a church until Jesus Christ comes back. The best days of the world, way world outreach are not behind us. And God has done a lot of great things and already in 20, 2023. But the greatest days of this ministry are ahead of us because God takes us from one level of victory to another level of victory. I want you to get this. Stop freaking out that you're going to lose what God has given you because God's ready to give you more than you've ever had. Stop glorifying, the, stop glorifying your past. Be thankful for your victories, but understand God has greater victories. Stop talking like one of the, I wish it was, I wish it was like back in the day. God says, back in the day it was great, but get ready for what I'm ready to do. It's something you've never experienced. How many believe that your best days in the Lord are not behind you, they're ahead of you if you just follow the right leader? I love this. Today we're going to talk for just a few minutes about a, a, a topic of, and this is God speaking to us, build me a church. And we're going to find out how churches are built. In, in America, there's over 380,000 churches in America. They average right around 65 people in attendance, which is around 24 million people that attend church on Sunday on a regular basis, but the reality is there's 331 million people in America. And that means right around 306 million people are lost, they don't know Jesus, and they're in need of a church that's on fire where they could connect with God. How many understand that? There's no building like a church building. We used to say back in the day, there's no party like a Holy Ghost party. A Holy Ghost party don't stop. But there's no building. Come on, there's warehouses around here. There's government buildings around here. There's stores around here. But there's not a bit, there's not a whole bunch of buildings where someone that's broken, someone that's depressed, someone that's addicted, someone that's suicidal, they could come into a place. They could come into a building with the presence of God and be set free, be given a brand new life. And it doesn't matter how impossible the situation looks we serve a God that's able to turn it around right now you're not here to spectate you're here to participate and God has a plan for your life let's give God one some big praise because he's worthy so let's pray father we just thank you show us how you build a church and use us to build and open up another church whatever community needs is an on fire church because as long as there's an on-fire church, the devil can't do whatever he wants to do. A church that's on fire with your spirit cannot be stopped. The gates of hell cannot stop a church that's filled with your spirit, led by your spirit, full of people that love you. So I just thank you. 
for your presence being here. I thank you for every person that's here. You love everyone. And I thank you. No one here will leave without hearing your voice and responding to it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to welcome the Pomona campus right now, Arrowhead. We're actually shooting this service into both the campuses today. So we're all unified today. So let's talk about the church. What is the church? I've heard a lot of people say, well, the church isn't a building. And I would, I would say this, uh, you're actually wrong. The church is a building. The church is a building, but it's also a group of people. So it's not just a building, it's believers. Believers all over the world that are living today and past believers that have given their lives to Jesus are part of the church, the body of Christ. But the church is also a building. It's a building that is dedicated to God where believers gather together to worship, serve one another, be equipped for the work of the ministry, learn the word of God, bring the earth, unsaved loved ones to experience the presence and power of God and make disciples. The church is also our physical bodies, which is called the temple of God. Every believer becomes a temple or a church. Now, a, a church is a place, another definition, is, is a place where God dwells or his presence is established. So when we establish a church in a city, well, we're telling the community, if you want to experience God, there's a building that's dedicated to experiencing the presence of God. I've seen more miracles happen in a church than anywhere else. I've preached on the streets and seen miracles. But if something happens when a group of believers come together and faith fills the room, and the Bible says when God's people come together where two or three are gathered, he is there in their midst, and there's a tangible presence of God and conviction in a room like this. There is no other room like this in the world. You could go to a club and you experience the tangibility of whatever is there. And sometimes you go into a dark place and you could even feel the demons that are in that place. Have you ever been in a dark place and just felt how creepy it is? There's buildings that they've dedicated shows on that they say the buildings have ghosts. And the rooms are haunted. And if you're watching those, those, those documentaries, it's not ghosts, it's demons. And they're actually there in the room and people's hairs are going, <laughs> they get goosebumps, whoa, they get freaked out because they know there's a presence of darkness in that room. But there's something different that's completely opposite in a church. There's no presence of darkness here that overrules this atmosphere. There's a presence and a love of God that can change your thinking, change your heart. And that's why an atheist could come in here and all of a sudden realize, wait a second, I'm experiencing experiencing th something tangible, I know now there's something in this atmosphere that's different. I remember at our, era, at our, at our Sierra Way campus, there was a young lady that came in and she was uh, just a full-fledged atheist. By the time the service was done, she came up and she was crying. And she goes, I don't know why I'm crying because I don't believe in this, but I'm having a hard time denying it because I'm experiencing it. See, we're not here to talk people into God. We're here to expose you to God, expose you to the healing, expose you to the freedom, expose you to the hope. Why not be a believer? It's a good title. Because if you're not a believer, this is the category you're in, a non-believer. Non-believers don't get nothing done. It's believers that believe that there's a solution, believe that there's an answer, believe that there's hope. Are there any believers in this place that are believing for your family, you're believing for your neighborhood, you're believing for your city? You're the answer that God can use. So we need churches. We need temples of God. Four steps to building a church. We get it, we're going to get our insight on how God builds a church by looking at the first church that was ever built on earth, and it was built through Moses. The greatest and most important thing we can do on earth is build a church for God. A place where his presence can be tangibly be experienced. As long as there is a church, the enemy cannot take over a city because a church won't let it happen. 
Where there is light, darkness has to flee. And that's why the enemy wants to shut down churches all over America. Because once he shuts down the light, this is what happens. Darkness can reign. But we're not going to let darkness reign in our homes. We're not going to let darkness reign in our government. We're not going to let darkness reign, come on, in Pomona, in Uganda, in Kenya, in our inner cities of the United States of America. Because we're going to turn on the light and we're bringing healthy, on fire churches that are full of the Holy Spirit to these places. There's been generations that focus on building churches and cathedrals. I was kind of looking at some of the cathedrals that were built in Europe, and some of those churches that were built in Europe were elaborate. The best craftsmanship in the world, even today, they're the most beautiful buildings in the world, and they were created to worship God in. Some of those buildings would take decades, and some of them centuries. I want you to think about, they had a vision that was so elaborate, so big, that it would take them centuries to complete it. Now, why would you have a, 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 a project or a vision that would take centuries? I'll tell you why. Because what God wants to do in your life needs to become generational. That it shouldn't just be one generation, but we should pass on this faith that we build churches, that we're continually building the kingdom of God from one generation to the next generation to the next generation. We'll never be done building churches. Places where God's presence can be found. It's true, the devil's not, he doesn't stop building liquor stores. He doesn't stop building marijuana dispensaries. He don't stop building strip clubs. But yet the church is stopping the most important project in the world, building places where people can experience and connect with God, not here. We are realizing that the Way World Outreach is going to build more churches and launch more churches, come on, than we've ever launched in the history, come on, of our church. So how do we do this? Some will say steps. There's steps to building everything. Step number one, this is how God builds a church on earth. God gives a leader a vision and passion to build him a church. I imagine that there must be a plan in heaven to establish churches all over the world, but there's a problem. If men and women of God aren't listening, he can't get the vision and the passion to them. God wants to do some great things in our lives, great things in your life. But the question is, are you so busy that you're not hearing the voice of God? It's not just building churches. It might be building a business, building a family, building a ministry. Your best days are ahead of you if you're listening to the voice of God. God is given vision. That's why the Bible says in the last days, he's going to pour his spirit upon all flesh. He's going to give vision. He's going to give dreams. He's going to give some prophetic insight about the future. And he's going to give passion to carry that out. Is there anybody focused enough to hear the voice of God, get a vision from God, allow God to put his passion in your heart and drive forward and complete that vision until it's, come on, keep fighting until it's done. Anybody here, come on, in Pomona, at Arrowhead? So this is how the first church was built. God told Moses to tell the people to build them a church. That was it. God uses his people to build him a church. Only, the only way God builds a church is through people. He wants the people to desire a holy sanctuary where they can meet up with him. This is what he wants. He, he's saying this, I want you to want it like I want it. Look at the scripture, Exodus 25, it says, have the people, this is talking to God speaking to Moses. So who, what, whose idea is it to build a church? It's God's. And this is what God told Moses. Have the people of Israel build me a holy sanctuary so I can live among them. He said, have them build me a holy place, or another way to say it, a home, a dwelling place for me. 
a place where I and my people can come together and commune. Tell them to build me a church. I remember 19 years ago, I was not planning to build a church. I was planning to build a career. I was involved in ministry. I was moving up in my career. I could see myself becoming the owner of a dealership. I was really in good position. I was a minority. They had a lot of breaks for minorities. I was really good at what I did. I became the company trainer. I was taking stores that were failing and turning them around and making them profitable. I, was, I knew my business. I loved the business. And then one night, I had a dream. God was able to speak to me through a dream. And this is what I heard in the dream. He says, go, they're sheep and you're their shepherd. And if you don't go, they won't have a shepherd. And that, that morning I woke up and you know when you receive the vision, when you repeat it. See, a lot of us are receiving visions from the devil and you're repeating it. That means you're, you're believing that your life is over. You're believing that you're a nothing. You're believing that everybody's against you. You're believing that you're stuck. You're believing that you're an addict. You're believing that you're going to always be depressed. You're believing that no, your marriage won't work out. You're believing that your kids will never turn around. And you're, all you're doing, and I know you believe it because you're always repeating it. And I'm, I, this is what you need to ask yourself. What story, false story, are you telling yourself? Because, I, and this is the other question, who are you getting your perspective from? Is it from God and his word and his promises? Or are you getting your perspective from circumstances, people that don't like you and have abused you, or maybe even the devil? How crazy that we're living in a society that's always high. We're always drunk. A matter of fact, we brag about it. What happened last week? And man, I just got faded. So what are you saying? Like, you just lost your mind and you gave your mind over to the devil and you were tripping and you think that's something to brag about? You were so, come on, you were so induced by alcohol that you crashed your car? They don't even let you drive a car under the influence. How are you going to manage your family under the influence? God is saying, st stop bragging about being under the influence of the devil and start, come on, bragging about being under the influence of God and his word. Is there anybody that wants a new perspective. Someone needs to hear from God. I repeated it. I woke up in the morning and this is how you know you're receiving a word from God. When you receive a vision from God, there's two things that you do. You write it down and then you declare it. You need to get a notepad. So when God gives you an idea, you don't let it go and lose it. See, when, when God gives you an idea, you have to take responsibility, own that thing. And you don't own it if you don't write it. Write it down. And then after you write it down, I know you have a vision because you can't stop talking about it. And in order to do that, you're going to have to stop talking about what you've been talking about. I already know where you're headed and you know where you're headed by your conversation. Many of us, our conversations are too petty, they're too small, and all you're talking about how big your mountain is, but you're not talking about how big your God is, and you're, you're stuck with impossibility, and God has said, come on, get your mind on future impossibilities. Everything's possible. Amen? So God said, build me a place. I love it. God's purpose for building him a church, check this out, is so he can live among us. Have the people build me a holy sanctuary so I can live among them, dwell with them, abide with them. And it means to exhibit his life in front of us. He said, I want you to build me a place where people can see my exhibits of my love 
exhibits of my power, exhibits my tes testimonies are being spoken of lives that are being transformed. There's thousands of people's lives being transformed every single week. There's people that come here strung out for 30 years and they come on, they spend a little time in the house of God and they're set free from one day to the next. That's a miracle. People are coming in here sick and they're being healed in a moment. What the doctors couldn't do, God does in a moment. What the psychiatrist couldn't do, God does in a moment. We serve a God that created the heavens and the earth and he wants to exhibit his power and he does it through his church. Give God some praise. It's the church is where he exhibits his power. I want a place to live that's dedicated to me alone. And any space we dedicate to God, he fills it. And he uses it to exhibit his power. So step number one, a leader receives a vision from God to build a church. We know at least that's happened around 380,000 times in the United States of America. But it needs to happen more. There's some business owners that are great, great business owners, and you're making a lot of profit and, but the, the problem is your profit is not being invested in the kingdom. God did not give you all that profit for just personal gain and just investing in your business. But he's also, come on, give me some of that profit to invest in the kingdom of heaven. We don't have more churches because sometimes we're lacking some resources. Those golf claps on that one. So Moses gets this vision to build a church in Isaiah 35, 1. I mean, Exodus 35, 1. He says that Moses called together the whole community of Israel and told them, these are the instructions the Lord has commanded us to follow. See, with every vision, there's instructions. Say it with me. With every vision, there's instructions. The vision is the destination. The instructions are the plan. You can have a vision, but if you don't have a plan, the vision will not come to pass. So vision comes with instructions. As long as we follow the instructions, we'll attain the vision. Why would we not deviate from making a cake, but we'll deviate from God's instructions? And they say, put eggs in the batter. Put eggs in the batter. Well, I don't feel like putting eggs. I want to put pomegranate juice. All right. You're not going to have no cake. But I think we think we're smarter than the instructions. Betty Crocker gives you the instructions. Do it this way, you'll get something that looks like the picture on the box. Don't do it this way. Don't complain. There's nothing wrong with Betty Crocker's instruction. The problem is you don't follow. There's instructions for your marriage. There's instructions for your business. There's instructions to raise kids. There's instructions the way you should think. That's why we're here, to get the instructions from God. But we're not here to hear them. We're here to do them. And if you don't know what to do, ask somebody. Stop trying to act like a know-it-all. I'm trying to help somebody. Even if you're here for the first time, I'm trying to help you. Some of us need to be shocked back into reality. How you doing? I'm okay. No, you're not. You know you're not. Some of you guys need to stop saying you're okay and realize I'm not good right now. I need to make some major changes in my life. That's why I'm here. I'm desperate for change. Come on. I'm desperate for my marriage to turn around. I'm desperate for my business to turn around. I'm desperate for my finances to turn around. I'm feeling right now discouraged, depressed. Something has to shift. And let us start with my thinking. Amen? Amen? So he shares his instructions. I'm going to tell you how to do a vision. God never gives you a vision you could do on your own. With every dream, God will give you a team. If you got a vision and you're trying to make it on your own, the, the, you're going to have a problem. Who are you sharing your vision with? God has people assigned to your, to your vision. You need to start including people. You can't move forward until your team has a buy-in. You got to share the vision that you have with somebody else because they're the teams that are going to help you make the dream come true. God doesn't do anything with Lone Rangers. There's no one-man shows in the kingdom of God. We need each other. So we know when we've truly received a vision, only after we put it in writing and are declaring it. 
visionaries and not focus on talking about the past or present problems, difficult people, meditating and declaring on, but they're meditating and declaring on unlimited possibilities and desired futures. They've meditated on the promises of God, the instructions of the word of God. The fact is that the, the Bible is called a book of instructions. It assumes that instructions were written. First written, then declared. Let's look at this verse in Joshua 1.8. This book of instructions must not depart from your what? Look, understand this. If you don't start getting some instructions of God and vision in your mouth and a plan in your mouth, understand this, your complaining is not going to fix nothing. Some of us are professional yelpers. Well, let me find out what's going on the way. You know, I don't, I don't like the way the pastor. <laughs> if all you're doing is complaining, you need to get a life. I don't got time to be yelping negative stuff because I got a life. I'm headed somewhere. There's a lot of pressure on my life, and I need God to help me. Is there anybody here that's done being negative, done complaining, because that's not going to fix nothing? You got to start getting God's word. Come on, get the answer in your mouth. Get the plan in your mouth and keep talking about it until you achieve it. And you're better off keeping your mouth shut if you don't know what you're talking about. Some of us need to fast talking nonsense. You actually think I'm doing something, I'm tearing them down. Like, well, that was awesome. Tearing people down should not be your vision. Lifting people up should. Come on, you'll never go out of business. Come on, helping other people succeed. God is saying, I want to do something great in your life. But you're going to have to change your conversation. You're going to have to change your vision. You're going to have to start speaking the instructions and making sure you're following them. Poor me. Stop it. The book of, the, look at this. This book of instruction must not depart from your mouth. You are to meditate on it day and night so that you may carefully observe everything written in, written in it. For then you will prosper and succeed in whatever you do. Check this out. He's saying if you meditate on the word, meditate on instruction, meditate on the plan, don't let it depart from your mouth. He guarantees you this, success. You know what success means? The achievement of a vision. The achievement of a goal. You can't have success without a vision. And it could be as simple as I'm going to graduate from high school. There's a success if you graduate. The question is, what are you aiming for? Stop, being trying, to stop trying to stop things from happening and start moving towards a, a, a place. I just don't want this to happen. That's not a vision. I just don't want to mess up. That's not a vision. A vision is I'm going to conquer. A vision is I'm going to conquer. I'm going to, come on. I'm going to go through holy wars. A vision is I'm going to be here next year and I'm going to be stronger than ever. A vision, uh, a vision is I'm going to write down a business plan. I'm going to find out how to get this thing done and I'm going to launch this business. I'm going to get my marriage back together. I'm going to start being the leader in my home. I'm going to overcome this addiction. I'm no longer, no longer going to remain depressed. We're going to kick this habit. We're overcoming. I'm not only overcoming, I'm going to pass on some victory to my family, to my neighborhood, come on, to my city. I'm going to be a world changer. Give God some praise if you're ready to receive some vision. There's something happening here. The presence of God is here. The word of God's being spoken. Vision is being birthed out in your heart. So now, Step number three. So we get vision. We speak vision. No one's building a church that's not speaking building a church. No one's opening another church in Pomona that's not talking about opening a church in Pomona. No one is going to have thousands of churches under their leadership unless they first start talking thousands of churches. Before you see it, before you see it, you got to talk it. If you don't have a faith to say it, you don't have faith to receive it. Amen? Come on. This is a leadership conference right now. Come on. This is the anointing of the leader, the visionary that God's trying to download in your life. You're being a victim. Small, small. I keep getting abused. The guy keeps walking out on me. You better get some value for yourself. Because if you don't value yourself, no one else will. 
getting quiet right there. All churches are built the same way with two simple instructions. Number one, instruction number one, take a sacred, sacred offering for the Lord. God will never build a church without an offering from the people because when we're given an offering, we are also given our hearts. See, in a, in a, if a church has no heart, a church is dead just like you if you have no heart. Any pastor that's launching a church that does not take a sacred offering but goes to the banks first is setting up his church to be a mortuary, not a place of resurrection. That's why they call it mort mort mortgage. It has the word mortuary in it. Death. Pastors that are listening out there, stop trying to take shortcuts. You got to go to the people because God will never build a church without using the people to build a church. And if their hearts aren't in it, it's not time to build. We got to get them loving God. Exodus 35, 4. This is what the Lord has commanded, Moses says. Take a sacred offering for the Lord. Let those with generous hearts. Let those with what? These are people that have the heart. A lot of us are, have no problem being generous to yourself. You have a problem being generous to others. You have no problem even being generous to the casino. But don't let God ask you for a little, come on, a little support to do his ministry. Nah, -uh. All they want is my money. Why don't you tell that to the casino? Stop going there. They're not building these beautiful cathedrals that look better than every church in the city because they're not taking your money. <laughs> I ran into some guy that's a millionaire on the streets. And, and he goes, oh, yeah. And he found out I'm a pastor. He goes, yeah, yeah, I don't like, I don't like to go to church because all they want is my money. I go, first of all, I go, I go, I go let, me, let me stop you right there. I pointed to his car, and he had an Escalade. I go, I know Escalades cost like 100 grand. He goes, why didn't you say that to the dealership? Because I know I work for a dealership. They want your money. It's funny. You only apply that to the house of God. And I'll tell you why you apply it to the house of God. Because you don't know God, and you don't love God, and you're not grateful for what he's done. But when you're grateful for what God has done in your life, you're saying, God, everything I got is yours. If it wasn't for you, I'd be lost. If it wasn't for you, I would have nothing. If it wasn't for you, I'd have no meaning in life. Lord, I'll give it to you. Do it again in someone else's life. The proof that you become a believer is you begin to care enough for others to give to them. Is there an amen on that? Amen. I love my wife, and the gifts get, keep getting bigger. I remember I bought her a ring, and it was the best I could afford. But and then she says, I like this ring. And it was 20 times more than the original ring. I go, we're going to talk about that? Let's let the Lord speak to us. <laughs> I, I seriously did that. My love needed to grow. I just said. And we were looking at that ring. And the next time we went to find the ring that she wanted, it was gone. And we couldn't find it. We went to another city in Utah, and lo and behold, they had the ring there. And, she, and they said, this is what they said. They had a picture of it. We could get it to you in a week. I go, well, I really wanted to buy it right now. It got out of that one. <laughs> you don't have it now? No. Huh, we bought it now. <laughs> Until we went to the Caribbean, and we saw the ring again. And Lisa says, here's the ring. You said you want to do it now. And I was ready to do it now. 
And I'm telling you, because, because it would make her happy. And I love my baby. I got that ring on her hand, and she wears it every single day. And she's proud because that ring doesn't just represent a diamond. It represents a man that loves her. And every gift that you're given today doesn't just represent the money. It represents your heart. It represents come on, your love for God, your love for people. And God's saying, don't hold back now because I'm ready to do something greater in your life than you've ever seen. Build me a church. So, how does God build a church? Through a sacred offering. It's the only way he does it. There's no shortcuts. Number two, instruction. Volunteer gifts and talents to build a church. God never builds a church without provision and skilled people to fulfill it. You know what that means? And this is a reminder, God did not give you the ability to do plumbing, electrical, drywall, paint, framing, welding, to just use it for your personal gain, but he also gave it for you to build a church. The church has always been built, come on, by those who give and volunteer their talent and craftsmanship to God for the purpose of building his kingdom church. And I'm not saying that, that, you're, that, that there's not times you get paid for stuff, but your whole, you cannot look at the church as another payday. You need to look at the church as an investment. God is saying, I've given you that gift to build your business. I've given you that build business. Come on, I've given you that skill. I gave it to you. Not too many people have that skill. But I also gave it to you for you to invest in the house of God and build some sanctuaries and build some temples and make, and, and make the church even more excellent. I'll tell you this. This platform was built for free by a framer. The railings. We're built for free by a welder. All the paint that you see on outside this building was given to us by a member of the church. And then two professional painters, two of them, would spend hours every single day painting this building for free. And the reason I'm saying that, just so you know, is because we couldn't have built it if it wasn't for that. We didn't have $200,000 to paint a building. But we had $200,000 of volunteer work, and we had $200,000 of skill, and we had $200,000 of, come on, offerings to be able to build this church. Let's give God some praise. Let's build some churches for God. And I guarantee you, you might not get paid here, but you're going to get paid somewhere else because it's going to be an expansion for your business because you cannot invest in the house of God without getting a really, really, really big return. Praise the Lord. So what happened? Those whose hearts were moved by God brought, brought everything needed to build the first church. In Exodus 35, 20, so the whole community of Israel left Moses and returned to their tents. Once they heard the instructions, take a sacred offering and those with talents, use them to build a church. They went back to their house in verse 21. All whose hearts, someone say hearts, were stirred. This is crazy. Because imagine that your hearts are stirred for everything else but the house of God. For the mission of God. When God's given an opportunity to build him a house, he's also checking hearts. All whose hearts were stirred and whose spirits were moved, whose spirits were what? That's why this offering is so important because whatever God tells you to give, you need to give because God's moving you. And, and this way, if God can move you to give, he can move you to your destiny. If he can't move you to give, he can't move you. They brought all the materials needed for the tabernacle. They were moved and came and brought their sacred offerings to the Lord. Who is the offering to? Who's receiving the offering? They brought all the materials needed for the temple. Both men and women came, all whose hearts, hearts were willing. Look at it, I get the word, heart again. 
And some of us need to break the spirit of greed and mammon in our lives today by saying, I am not going to let my heart get hard on a situation like this. Because if I'm resisting this, there's something trying to stop me from building the kingdom of heaven and re reaching one more soul for Jesus. I cancel out that thing. And right now I'm going to give a sacrificial offering and I'm going to give my heart to God because where your treasure is, your heart will follow. You can't say you're totally surrendered to God until you become a giver. It's getting quiet. Now it's getting real quiet. In Pomona, I'm sure, and Arrowhead everywhere. <laughs> Look at this. They brought all the materials needed for the tabernacle. They brought everything needed to build the church. Both men and women came, all whose hearts were willing. They brought to the Lord their offerings of gold brooches, earrings, rings from their fingers and necklaces. They presented gold objects of every kind as a special offering to the Lord. You know what they were saying basically? What else can I do? And then one of them said, look, the ring on your finger. Oh, yeah, that too. What about that gold brooch or whatever that is on your head? That too. So they were not thinking the least they could do. They were thinking the most they could do. When was the last time that you were searching, saying, God, what is the most I could do to give to your honor, to come on, to give to you for, for your honor? And God is saying, this is the kind of spirit that builds churches. And it creates an atmosphere of the unlimited power of God in an atmosphere like that. Because the people's hearts are sold out. And number four, the next step is the church is completed. The vision is accomplished. Many people start many projects, but they don't finish them. As soon as they run into challenges, they quit. Your job and your life needs to be mission accomplished. Don't change the vision because your circumstances change. Get a vision from God. Keep speaking that vision. Keep following instructions until you could say the vision is accomplished. And once the vision is accomplished, guess what you get? an opportunity for a greater vision. How many understand that? The reward for accomplishing a vision of God is greater vision. And this is what they did. In Exodus 40, 34, it says, so at last, Moses finished the work. It got done. We just didn't talk about it. We did it. In Matthew 25, 23, it says, his master said to him, excellent, excellent. You are a good and trustworthy servant. You have been faithful with a small amount. So I'll put you in charge of a large amount. Come, enjoy the master's happiness. This is cool. See, some of us have a great vision, but God, and you're saying, I know that God has called me to greatness, but understand this, you cannot take shortcuts to greatness. You're not going to accomplish great things if you're a quitter. Some of you are in our thinking about quitting, and you should be thinking about, you should, you should be thinking about persisting. You should be thinking about growing. You're trying to run from your process. Just because there is a challenge doesn't mean that God's not with you. God is saying, is there anybody that wants it bad enough that's willing to be faithful when it's hard, when it's difficult? And God has said, if you're faithful and you complete the vision I'm giving you now, it will lead to that destiny that you've been dreaming about. Amen? Come on. I'm going to end it with this. Three blessings of building God a church. Blessing number one, the glory and presence of God will fill the church and our lives. In Exodus 40, 34, after they finished it, then the cloud, uh, uh, Exodus 40, 34, then the cloud covered the tabernacle and the glory filled the tabernacle. God is saying, the blessing of building me a church is I'll fill you, I'll fill the church I'll fill your family with my presence, with my glory. The word glory is kabod, and it means the presence, the abundance, the riches, the splendor, the greatness, and supernatural power of God confirmed through signs and wonders. God is saying, you build me a church and I'll fill it with my presence. It's not just going to be another building with four walls and stucco. It's going to be a building that's separated from every other building because this building is going to have a supernatural aspect to it. My presence will be there and it will fill that place. I remember, I remember when we first started the church, our first service was at a community center. We dedicated, we prayed for that community center. 
we worship in that community center and we say, God, for right now, this is your space. Fill it with your presence. And I remember that first service. I would stay sometimes, for, I would stay as long as I could praying for people. But I saw something special in that atmosphere. I started praying for people and it was crazy. They just started falling down. I wasn't pushing nobody. The power of God was meeting up with them. So what happens a lot of times is that the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light clash and God doesn't fall, man falls and the demon falls. Understand that. And, and I remember as I started praying for them, I started hearing voices as they're speaking and I started realizing some of them were demon possessed and they needed freedom. And that was just our first services. We started seeing the manifestation of God that it wasn't just a building. It wasn't just a motivational seminar, but it was a place that they would encounter their final freedom so they could be everything that God called them to be. Some of us have a demonic assignment on us and we need the freedom that only Jesus can give. Who the Son set free is free indeed. I started seeing people get healed. I started seeing homeless come off the street. There was something in that atmosphere that was creating supernatural manifestations of God. That means the glory of God was there and it's still here. It'll be in every building. The glory. Blessing number two, supernatural guidance. In Exodus 40, verse 36, now whenever the cloud lifted from the tabernacle, so just, they built this church and a, and a cloud of God came over the church. It wasn't a cloud, a regular cloud. It was a supernatural cloud. So now what would happen, it would rest on the church and there were millions of God's people around that church. And they wouldn't move until the cloud began to lift. And they would move. And when the cloud lifted, they would move. Understand this. Many of us are guessing, and you should be at a point that you're being led by the Spirit. See, when you're being led by the Spirit, this is what happens. Not only do you accomplish vision, you got perfect timing. So it would lift and it would follow perfect timing. It's not just doing what you're supposed to do. It's doing it when you're supposed to do it. And this is what God is saying. If I can lead you to give, I can lead your life. If you could build me a church, I'll build your life. Is there anyone here that wants perfect timing and you want perfect execution? And God is saying, there's not a vision I give you that you won't accomplish if I'm leading you in timing, instruction, and destination. I love it. 40 verse 36 says, Now whenever the cloud lifted from the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out on their journey following it. But if the cloud did not rise, they remained where they were until it lifted. I'm telling you, there's somebody right now, you're ready to make a move, and you're not supposed to make a move because God's not giving you the green light. You're just desperate. See, I, this is how I've, we've built and done everything we've done. Every vision that, we've, that God has given us, every one of them has been accomplished. And what it does, when you accomplish vision, it gives you credibility as a leader. But you have to know, I have a lot of vision. And I always say this, I put it on the shelf until there's a timing thing in me. There's a desperation. God says, now is the time. And then when I run with that timing of the Lord, there's nobody could talk me out of it. So the reason some of us are being talked out of it, because it wasn't God's idea, it wasn't God's timing, it was you. It all begins today. You give an offering, you're going to start getting perfect timing and perfect guidance. You're not going to miss it anymore. And you're not going to be guessing anymore. And you're not going to be confused anymore because you're going to hear the voice of God from here on out. And blessing number three, the whole community and our families will see and experience the presence of God. We're going to see our families and community come to faith in Jesus Christ because they've seen and experienced the love and the power of God for themselves. Atheists and agnostics are going to become believers. Addicts are going to be set free. The depressed will be healed emotionally and be filled with the joy of the Lord. The sick will be healed and the least likely will be saved. They won't be able, they won't be able to be talked out of it because they experienced it for themselves. Look at this in Exodus 40, 30 in this last verse. The cloud of the Lord hovered over the church or the tabernacle during the day. 
And at night, fire glowed inside the cloud so the whole family of Israel could see it. The whole community could see it. The whole city could could see it. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, we see the fire. Without a shadow of a doubt, we see God. And without a shadow of a doubt, we know God is there. Without a shadow of a doubt, we're experiencing God. I can't deny it. I'm seeing it. This continued throughout all their journey. The community will say, if you're hungry, go to the way. If you're homeless, go to the way. If you're hopeless, go to the way. If you're addicted, go to the way. If your marriage is struggling, go to the way. We can't help you. I'm a counselor, but I can't change your life. If you are depressed and suicidal, go to the way. If you need Jesus, go to the way. If you need counseling, go to the way. If you have children and teens that need help mentoring, go to the way. The church makes Jesus famous and tangible. A city and community that's on fire, has an on-fire church in their city has access to the unlimited presence of God. Let's give God some praise. Pomona has no chance. They're going to experience the presence of God. Your family's going to see it. The community's going to see it. The city's going to see it. Our nation's going to see it. Your God is going to see it. Kenya's going to see it. Everywhere they go, they're not just going to get a speech. They're going to get intangible experience with the power of God. Give God some praise because he's a good God. So now, Let's all stand up. Let's all stand up. We're, we're almost on dismiss. Don't leave right now. This is a sacred moment. We're going to build a church. We're going to open up a church for Jesus. I, Pastor, when are we going to stop building churches? Why don't you tell McDonald's and all those people, why are you going to stop building McDonald's? They're going to say, never, we're expanding. This should be the greatest franchise in the world, the church. Because everybody needs Jesus. Come on. Everybody needs peace. Everybody needs eternal life. Okay. How many, how many, how many ushers we got up here? I, well, of course. You got to get prepared for that. Come on, we got to prepare for overflow. I'm going to believe that. Okay. We need to have like six or seven up here. Okay. Okay, let's go. All right, let's, let's pray. We're going to bring an offering to the Lord. Okay. We're going to bring an offering to the Lord. And this one, I want you to bring because it's sacred to God. So if you went online and you gave it, still just pass by, touch the, just touch the offering basket as a sign of faith. And let's get this thing done for the glory of God. We're going to get this down payment. We're going to open the church. If you're here for the first time, I want you to understand this, that we have men's homes, women's homes. We're feeling that we have a, a warehouse that just gives food to the hungry. I got a, we got homes here, a home here that rescues women and children from abusive situations, rescues them from the street, rescues them from homelessness. And they go into our homes and we take care of those kids. We feed them. The guys we feed. The ladies we feed. We're, we're as a church, we're, we're taking care of an orf, orphanages in, in, in Kenya. And, and we're, and we're going to take on another orphan, orphanage coming up pretty soon where, where, where the guys from the Congo came in and raped four of the girls and bashed in one of the kids' mouths open. That's the church we're taking over. Nobody wanted that church. We want that church, and we're going to heal those little boys and little girls. They don't have the finances, but all of us together, we can reach them. How do we feed? That's all this is about. It's not about money. It's about God is saying, come on, do this for me. That's all we're doing. We're giving it to the Lord, and you're going to see the tangible, the tangible work being done. Let's pray. Lift up your offering, and, and as we're done with this, I said, if you want to come up, you can. And, and it's, all, it's all those that are moved to give. That's it. But I would say this. Participate somehow. Give something. Put some seed in the ground so you can get a return for you and your family. God is saying, this is not just for the community. Your family is going to see God. They're going to experience this. Don't expect an, a return in a place that there's no investment in. Get ready. Father, right now, we just thank you. 
I thank you for this amazing church. I thank you for Pomona Campus. I thank you for Arrowhead. I thank you for Arizona. I thank you for TJ. I thank you for the church in Kenya. I just thank you, Father, for the churches in Uganda that we're ready to launch out pretty soon. And I thank you for the Way World Outreach in Hallmark Campus. Father, everyone that's right now given, they'll see these three blessings in their lives. Their homes will be filled with the presence of God. Their homes will be filled with the joy of God. Their home will be filled with the satisfaction only God can give. The supernatural power is going to be released at a greater level in our church, in our families, in our personal lives. Father, we receive the blessing, Father God, of divine guidance. Many of us right now, the spirit of confusion is going to be broken. Because, Father, as they're given today, they're going to hear in their voice, your voice finally. And they're no longer going to push it off. They're going to say, okay, God, I'll give what you asked me to give. Though there's people right now that they're selling a piece of property and they were talking, thinking about keeping the tithe for themselves. But God's saying, come on, that belongs to me. And I'll open up the windows of heaven over your life. Whatever you're trying to withhold from me is seed for a greater harvest. Give it to me. Surrender it to me. And you will see open windows of blessing over your life. And Father, most of all, we're going to see, Father, our family experience and get to know you as their Lord and Savior. They're going to see you. They're going to experience you. There's nobody that's impossible to reach. Everything's possible with God. So we give you this offering, and we're so grateful, and I'm so grateful, Father, for this church. Every person here matters so much. And you've exposed us to even this teaching because you're ready to give us greater vision than we've ever seen. Every single person here will prosper. Every single family member here will go farther than they ever imagined, Father. You're going to give them above and beyond whatever they've asked. And, Father, even at thought or ask, I thank you, Lord, that great blessing is ready to overflow through them, to the community, them, to their families. It's happening now. I thank you, Lord. All of us are working together to do this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give with a cheerful heart. Just come up and give your offering and we'll dismiss. We're dismissed after this already. If you need prayer, we do have teams that will come up and pray with you afterwards. God bless you.